Well, I'd like to thank you all and welcome you all here for the final panel. And I'd also like to, to thank our new chancellor. As, a, as the child of historians, um, we had constant battles as I uh, envisioned my career as one in the sciences and only in the sciences. And my parents kept reminding me that that was a uh, particularly uh, out of family experience, as they called it several times. We have a, a really remarkable panel today. Uh, my friend and colleague, Paul Olivosatos, uh, professor and director of Lawrenceburg National Laboratory, Peter Bierman, uh, professor of social sciences at Columbia, Carol Becker, dean of the faculty and, and a professor in the School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia, um, Chu J. Uh, Kim Liu, um, a professor and dean in what we call here EECS, electrical engineering and computer science, and then we'll have Dean Shankar Sastri commenting on it. So this is really a place to bring these topics together. And in fact, if if one word were to characterize Berkeley to me as a university, a university laboratory partnership and a community, it would be the topic of this panel, innovation. And innovation has a whole range of interesting meanings. Um, in fact, as a undergraduate at Cornell, I had the uh, sort of remarkable opportunity to have Hans Bethe um, as, as my undergraduate mentor. Um, at Stanford, my first research paper was with Art Schaulau, uh, who co-discovered with a Berkeley professor the laser. And so I noted that my career has been downhill since the first paper, because you really can't, you can't beat that in the process. And as a graduate student at Harvard, Ed Purcell and Steven Weinberg were, were mentors. And despite the fact that they had huge accolades in their field, all of them highlighted the incredible importance and opportunity of thinking across disciplines. And in fact, when I got to Princeton as a faculty member, Toni Morrison, not in my field at all, was assigned in a wonderful way as a mentor. And so this dialogue between science and the humanities is really, I think, in my blood. When I think about the many meanings and the many aspects of innovation that I hope we'll cover today, one that really stands out, and again, it's why Berkeley, I think, is such a critical model, is the term coined by a political scientist who thought incredibly long and hard about innovation and how to nurture it, and that was actually the dean at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School who brought me there, Don Stokes, who coined the term, which I use in virtually every lecture to this day, as my students can unfortunately attest, and that is the idea of use-inspired basic research. And as I mull those words in various orders, it comes back over and over again, how critical and how interesting it is to do work in that area. And again, those series of very august mentors that I mentioned all brought this topic together. Use-inspired basic research that Don Stokes categorized as pastures quadrant, an area of really thinking hard about impacting the world, but making fundamental innovations that will be remembered. In fact, when I moved here to Berkeley, um, I again had this incredible honor to step into a faculty position that had been created for the founder of the program called the Energy and Resources Group that I moved to initially on campus. That faculty position was created for John Holdren, who is another, who's like me, a physicist, and is today President Obama's science advisor. And of all the topics and examples of areas um, I don't think it was totally by coincidence, but the area where I, I use and, uh, as the defining terms for my own work is really the nexus between what I believe are the two biggest challenges facing humanity going forward, and that is climate change and humans' role in causing it, and the persistent problem of energy poverty, where one-fifth of all people don't have access to energy resources today. Bringing access to those people for all of the benefits from lighting and uh, entrepreneurial activities, at the same time, be building a low carbon economy is a huge, huge challenge. Berkeley and LBL, the local municipal community, the state of California, our series of governors, have, as you know, all been huge leaders in this area. And from basic science on solar cells to finding opportunities to scale up its use, to developing behavioral economic techniques to understand how we can make the ideas of energy efficiency and better and wiser consumption part of our economy, in many ways it really defines a whole area which is defining my career around this idea of use-inspired basic research. And so as I think about what you'll hear about in this panel today, I'm brought back again multiple times over to think how lucky I am to be here, how lucky I am to have a chancellor who understands and has really promoted regional work and understanding the interplay between academic work and field projects, 
and really recognize that to me, University of California, Berkeley is really Pasteur's university. So I welcome you to the final panel. Well, so I'd like to start by really um, thanking Chancellor Dirks for challenging our community to think about the essence of what a great university is and, and to challenge us on the themes of education, should it be uh, practical or liberal, and uh, should the university be uh, inward and local, or should it be outward and global, and, and, and should our scholarship be um, really at the core of fundamental questions, or should it be uh, trying to change things in a practical sense? How, how do we balance all of these things? And for me personally, um, I have spent my research career here at Berkeley, and so I have come to feel over time that there is a Berkeley style that imbues uh, scholarship here at this great institution. And, and it's really about uh, uh, being a place where people think hard about uh, the um, problems that are challenging society today from a perspective uh, that is deep, trying to generate new ideas, but also wanting to be engaged at the point where the debate is really active in our society and to be part of the transformation of society in a way that is public spirited uh, and that is really um, looking to create a common good uh, for our society and for humanity. That's really a Berkeley style that, that is very fundamental. I personally was very fortunate uh, to be educated as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, an amazing place and an incredible experience. And I, I want to just mention there that um, in my education as a scientist, uh, the, I, I can say that my uh, courses in the liberal arts, in the humanities and history and so on, in the core curriculum there, probably taught me uh, at least as many skills that I use every day as a scientist as the technical classes that I took. So I felt very fortunate to have had that experience as a young person. But when I came to Berkeley, I did find this atmosphere of wanting to see scholarship really engage. And, and that affected me a lot. So in my own research um, into the field of nanoscience, I've tried uh, throughout my career to work with my students uh, to balance between trying to understand core principles of nanoscience, how, do, how can we control matter on small scales and how does matter behave at a very fundamental level in different and distinct ways when it's very, very small. And there are many differences that are really fun to understand. But also, for me, it's been important always to be seeking ways that that science could touch society and have an effect on it. And so we've been involved in trying to find uh, practical outcomes of our research in areas that relate to bioimaging and medicine and to renewable energy. And, and, and th that uh, dialogue between those two has been enriching and has made both stronger. So for me, that's a case where it hasn't been a versus, it's been a how these two can, can, can truly reinforce each other. And, and when I think about the future of the university and also about um, what I see happening um, more broadly in society and the world, I see that this uh, aspect of fundamental and applied remain linked together in constructive ways. Uh, science is advancing at an incredible rate. Um, societal needs are really uh, becoming more and more complex. Uh, the two areas that I'm personally interested in right now as a scientist are ones that relate to um, sustainability and energy and environment issues. And, and personally, recently, I've gotten very interested in the, uh, the science of the brain. And in those two areas, I defy anybody to try to understand the distinction between fundamental and applied. These are two things that work together uh, in fascinating ways. Um, in fact, um, it, it, it's also very interesting to me to see how this dialogue sometimes can become a little bit confused. Uh, we see this trend, for example, in federal funding of science where there's this desire to really, um, we must make sure that our, our, our investment has an impact as quickly as possible. And, and in the course of doing that, sometimes we actually slow things down. 
uh, because uh, we, we, instead of asking the underlying questions, we might be, you know, forcing, uh, trying to force a solution based on what we know today. Uh, we had an interesting experience recently um, where, uh, you know, a lot of funding comes into the national lab, to Lawrence Berkeley lab up on the hill to try to, to, to deal with problems of sustainability, energy, and environment. A lot of research going on there. But, but recently we were able to work with the Kavli Foundation, a private source of money that came and said, uh, we would really uh, like to support you to understand the fundamentals of energy on the nanoscale. How does it really happen at the deepest level? And um, I'm hoping that that dialogue between now what is uh, p privately funded research and publicly funded research, that those two uh, will somehow produce between them answers that, that will help us in this area of, um, of, of sustainability, which is really so important for the future of our planet. I'd like to just conclude there and say that I think there's a very powerful uh, Berkeley style that really um, will help inform the kinds of questions that the chancellor has posed to us. So um, I, it's a great thrill to be here. And um, thinking about the, the brain drain, um, I can just say that um, Columbia is the big loser. Uh, and uh, you guys are the big winners, um, getting um, our good friends and uh, great scholars, uh, Nick and Janicki, to come. So congratulations. Uh, I'm the social scientist here. And um, so I'm going to really focus mainly on social science. And, and I thought I would. Um, start off with um, something our, one of our founding fathers said um, at the end of a, a great book called uh, Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He, he, he says, uh, specialists without spirit, centralists without heart, this nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved. That's not a description of Congress. That's a description of the academy um, and the world. And, um, and especially true for social science, where um, right now, I think um, a large swath of the American population and an equally large swath of our elected representatives um, think uh, and actively engage in the belief that social science is just a matter of opinion about topics that are largely irrelevant to everyone. And that's the context that um, we have to do our work. And it's obviously um, the problem that um, we have to solve. And it's the problem that we have to solve through some form of innovation. So how did we get to this situation where lots of people um, think we're irrelevant, um, in large part because we are? Um, <laughs> And one of the reasons that we are is that the pursuit of disciplinary prestige in the academy leads us away from engagement with real problems with real people. Um, and that's especially true for the social sciences. And there's really only one exception to that rule for us, which is our engagement and collaboration with hard sciences or the health sciences. Um, but one of the ironies of that, of that in a, of that collaboration is that social scientists engage with hard sciences on their problems. It's been what I've been doing for years, um, but what I've come to realize is that that collaboration is great for the hard sciences and the health sciences, but it hasn't done very much for social science. So for example, the entire epigenetic revolution in genetics arose from that collaboration, but it didn't revolutionize social science because we already knew that gene environment interaction uh, shaped, um, sorry, we already knew that thinking about the environment um, uh, was uh, required to make sense of uh, gene expression. And I think across a lot of these collaborations, this is the, this is the picture that we see that the, that the benefit and the innovation uh, travels in one direction. So for social scientists, um, aside from our helping to shape heart science, um, our question is, how do we energize ourselves to become more relevant? And the fact that disciplinary prestige in the academy is the highest uh, for those whose work is the most abstract means that when social science disciplines compete for prestige, they do so by solving largely chimerical problems of their own devising and turning away from the messiness of the world because the world is messy and the world, if you deal with messy things, you lose, you lose status. And it's that process and that dynamic that makes our work sterile and appear and maybe be largely irrelevant. 
Um, so the sterility of the social sciences and the problems that we work in have led a whole bunch of people to now say, well, actually what we should do is just replace all of these uh, old disciplines which are defunct with knowledge, uh, uh, problem-oriented knowledge communities. So maybe you read this uh, great op-ed by Nicholas Kostakis a couple of months ago, which proposes that solution. But you might have noticed that every, uh, every example he has um, is, a, is a model for social science contribution to science, rather than a model for social science contribution to ourselves. So that's one of the problems with that solution. There are really, other, there are really two other things that are bad about this idea. First of all, as everybody knows, um, uh, mastery of disciplinary standpoints is critical for scientific progress and innovation. So we, we can just see this borne out in the sciences and, and in our collaboration with the sciences. And secondly, the social science disciplines, which were shaped in the 19th and 20th century, were shaped to solve social problems. And actually, those problems haven't gone away. Um, they've just gotten worse. So I'll just name a few of them. Despair, inequality, hopelessness, intolerance. And we could go on and on. So it's not like we have um, no problems. We have all sorts of good problems. The, the problem is, how do we get to uh, do more interesting work to solve them? And the solution is in dumping disciplines. So here are some ideas towards the solution. The, the solution is to build on the strengths of disciplines, but to reorient work towards creating new ways of thinking about classic problems that count, and principally by doing this by, principally doing this by structuring interdisciplinary collaborations that make possible seeing these classic problems from multiple standpoints simultaneously. To travel, and this is my favorite quote, which I, I never found in Proust, but R.D. Lang did, uh, to travel um, through a, th uh, a single land with a thousand pairs of eyes. And um, if we can achieve that, we can then reveal the prismatic quality of real problems in new ways. So most of my previous work, um, I've, I've focused on trying to attack the mechanisms of social reproduction and change. For example, diffusion dynamics, influence processes, so that we can, we can from that point of view, attack important problems and maybe even predict the outcome of important things. That's one kind of particular strategy of collaboration that one could follow. My new work, I'm focusing on the boundary between humanities and social sciences because we have this incredible vast treasure trove of textual qualitative material that's simply waiting to be uncovered and which in, in a mo an incredibly direct way speaks to the classical problems of social science, all of which are problems at the heart of meaning. So I think this is the second major collaborative uh, theme that we can work on. And the next and maybe the most obvious theme, and I think comes closest to the Berkeley uh, the Berkeley vis vision is that we need to mobilize that work that we do inside the academy um, and actively embed it like Pasteur did for, for, the, for milk and the pasteurization of France to actively embed our innovative work into larger interaction networks in order to change the world. Uh, and that's, of course, the mechanism by which um, innovations really stick. I just thought, since we're here on the occasion of installing a new chancellor, um, I'll give a little bit of advice. Um, it's great, because for a decade, Nick would ask me for advice, and I, and I always gave it to him, and he always ignored it. And um, so I can assure you he has great judgment. Um, but here's, um, here's a couple pieces of advice. This is actually where, you know, to drive innovative work and to make, to make social science relevant again, leadership is really important. First. Leadership can identify and support programs that work with rather than against the academic life course. And um, uh, if you think about it, many of our programs that are designed to create new ideas are actually orthogonal to the way in which we build careers. So I can say more about that later. But the most important point, and where I'll end, is that it's very, very difficult to drive disciplines to try something completely different, which is to collaborate rather than to police their borders and to take seriously the idea of mobilizing their discoveries into action outside of the laboratory. And if that can happen anywhere, it can happen in Berkeley, where as you've described, there's this substantive tradition where research has always been valued, where the humanities have always been strong, and where for the social sciences, the idea of research oriented to the possibility of change has been and remains largely intact. So good luck, Nick. <laughs>
I, I really want to thank um, Chancellor Dirks and Janicki for including the arts in this symposium and this very important symposium. And um, few people really understand the nature of research in an art school environment and probably even less understand the nature of art research in a research university. So I thought I would, I would talk to that today. Um, the work of artists really simply is research. And it's often research into the nature of representing very complex issues, such as personal memory, think of Proust, remembrance of things past, or collective memory, think of Steve McQueen's new film, 12 Years a Slave, um, or the question of how the individual intersects with society, think Tony Kushner's Angels in America, or think Picasso's Guernica, for that matter, or how ideas manifest in form, how form morphs and migrates and changes perception. Think of James Terrell's Sky Spaces. So artist research helps us to contemplate where ideas come from and under what conditions they thrive. And one could say, I think, that the work of art and artists is a type of irreverent research. And it re because it refuses uh, external quantification and or the insistence on conventional deliverables. But it's nonetheless essential to the well-being of the species. So artists will use any form, any discipline, they'll steal ideas from anybody to further their goal of answering the questions that they pose for themselves. And so much artist work is really that, answering a question that they pose for themselves. And so inherently, the work of artists is interdisciplinary. So how does an art school environment encourage this approach? How do we keep that good irreverence alive? And I would say by pursuing and legitimating the activation of multiple types of consciousness. And what I mean by that is that we don't just value the conscious mind, which is only where one layer of observation occurs, but also dreams, fantasies, imagination, play, intuition, the unconscious, the metaphoric, the symbolic and the visionary. This is the type of research that explore, explores the total potentiality of human thought. What are we really capable of thinking and how can we think it? So in, actually in an art school, we never use the term innovation. And why is that? And I think it's because that term uh, really implies instrumentalization of these multiple consciousnesses uh, to a goal. And rather we talk about creativity. And this word signifies to us an ongoing process through which things are revealed. And we go into it knowing that we might not know what things are revealed. And in very, this way, we're very close to the sciences. Um, we attempt to create an environment that is safe for this process to occur and for the total person to emerge. And in that, I think we're very much like Winnicott with the notion of a holding environment, like the psychoanalytic environment where a whole person feels the, has the space to present him or herself. And this is what we do every day, is we try to create that kind of environment. Now, I've been on panels in Davos with business school deans, and they have said to me, our students come in to business school, they're very interesting people, that's why we take them. But then by the time they leave, you know where this is going. Uh, <laughs> I'm not good at jokes, I'm not good at jokes. Um, by the time they leave, they all want the same job, they have the same goals, they have the same orientation, they're very homogeneous. And I would say that we take interesting students, and by the time they leave, they're more interesting, and they are more actualized, which is really the important point here. And that's because their work, their research, is original to themselves. They work from the inside out, and therefore they create new knowledge all the time, because no one can know the knowledge, no one has access to that knowledge, except the individual person. So it's really the cultivation of the individual that we're interested in. And we really want to create an experimental environment. And in this, also, we're very much like the sciences, where risk is part of the game every day and where there is the inevitability of failure. So Beckett, fail, fail again, fail better. I think fail better is the mantra of the art school. Fail better. Um, and knowing that uh, the outcomes, we should never go into a process assuming answers. And I think Saul talked to this. Like, you're not a good scientist if you know the answer. Like, you, you ask the question, and then you derive another question from the question, 
and you keep proceeding in this way. And this is very much the way that we think about our environment in an art school. And I think increasingly there's recognition that artists have something very important to add to the conversations that we're having today. And this has to do with the challenges of the world. The, uh, last week, the um, New York Times announced that the new museum in New York was starting a new uh, incubator. This is the first time that a museum is actually taking on an incubator with 70 engineers, tech developers, architects, and artists. And they're researching issues like the city, the environment, communication, poverty. And I think this will be the first time that a visual arts institution is doing such a thing with the notion that artists will be at the center of these teams. Artists will be at the core. And the city of New York and the Ford Foundation have already come up to the plate and they've already given $2 million to begin the process. So the new museum, because they work with contemporary artists, they are aware that many artists are already trying to work on social issues and that artists are going to come at these questions in very unique ways. President Bollinger and others today talked about the complex issues that we're facing as a species, the global issues, the national issues, the convergence of both of them. You need teams of thinkers. We need teams of thinkers. We've all said that. Uh, Cross-discipline with different strengths, different methodologies, different approaches to address these questions. Artists will come at these questions in completely unique ways, and they will come at the representation of the solutions of these questions in completely unique ways, ways that can communicate to people, ways that extend out, as you were talking about, Peter, outside their in individual discipline. So I brought you, um, I have a visual aid. This is uh, Oliver Eliasson's little son. I won't put it on, but okay, so here we go. Um, <laughs> Oliver Eliasson, who, who did those beautiful waterfalls in New York, um, he created this thing called the little son. This little son has already affected 1.6 billion people. To Oliver, this is an art project. This is a solar, solar operated, five hours of sunlight, four hours of sunlight, five hours of light. And it came not from the idea, oh, I'm going to create a solar solution to the problem of light and energy and in underdeveloped societies. It came from the notion, how do you keep light from fading? It came from a poetic idea. How do you capture light so it doesn't fade away? And then it became, how do you capture light for people who have no access to light? And this has become an enormous project all over the world. And he says it's a work of art that works in life. And I think you're going to see increasingly artists intervening in society in very aggressive ways using this kind of research that starts with the poetic and comes up with some really unimagined solution. So I just want to say that you have here uh, at Berkeley a fantastic place called the Artist Research Center. And I think it's a great place to start this conversation. So thank you. Chancellor Dirks, and distinguished members of the audience, and my colleagues, so I appreciate your time to give, give me this opportunity to share my thoughts on basic and applied research. Um, I think what makes Berkeley great is not only its breadth of excellence, but also its strong tradition of collaboration across disciplines toward a mutual goal. And this is the um, style that Professor Oliver Vesatos was referring to. And our mutual goal is to make this world a better place. I believe that these are key factors to uh, Berkeley's preeminence among the world's top universities. So as the engineer here, I'm going to speak, uh, give some examples. So uh, CITRUS, which stands for the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, uh, exemplifies this. CITRUS researchers share a vision of making a positive impact on society through advancements in information technology. And they come from engineering and physical sciences, and they also come from social sciences for example, political science and sociology, and humanities, so law and history, for example. And in the past, we've had artists in residence. So that brings an additional dimension of creativity and a perspective on social issues. Um, so examples of citrus initi initiatives include sustainable energy and affordable healthcare, quality healthcare for the world. The applied research that my colleagues and I perform is driven by societal applications to improve the quality of life for a global community. And it is built on a large foundation of basic research. Innovations at the forefront of engineering, by definition, involve novel application of scientific knowledge. Uh, one short example is uh, 
in my research on advanced transistor technologies, we're trying to come up with new technologies that will lower the energy requirements of future electronic devices so they can be used more pervasively. And that only is possible if we can leverage new phenomenon that emerge when we um, look at devices at the nanometer scale. So if we can nanoscale engineering, nanoscale uh, device engineering, then we can actually uh, t apply new science, scientific phenomenon uh, to reach our goal. So I think that continuing support of basic and applied research is going to be necessary to sustain comprehensive excellence and to continue to attract the best and brightest students and faculty members to Berkeley. But we all know that the cost of basic and applied research is only growing. And this is not only true for the sciences and engineering, I understand it's true for humanities and social sciences as well. But these costs can be mitigated through collaboration, um, the sharing of resources. So I'd like to give another example, the um, Berkeley Marvell Nanofabrication Lab, which is located in the Citrus headquarters building here at Berkeley. This is a prime example of a shared research lab. Uh, it comprises 15,000 square feet of shared clean room research space. It has 500, over 500 users, uh, representing more than 60 professors across this campus. And this shared lab model has really um, allowed us to make more efficient use of space and of funding, but also has fostered cross-fertilization of ideas. So new ways of thinking, as um, Peter mentioned. And also, interestingly, while this nanolab has fostered interdisciplinary research, it also has served as a springboard for startup companies to uh, launch uh, successful businesses. So it also has had direct economic as well as social impact. So in summary, I think that Berkeley has all of the elements needed to continue to be the world's leading public university under our new leadership, and that our collective future is very bright. Thank you. Good afternoon. I, I realize I'm the person that stands between you and lunch, so I'll, <laughs> I'll try to stay on time. Uh, let me, since uh, Peter said it, let me say we are very glad to ex accept the brain drain from Columbia and welcome Nick and John Key to Berkeley. Uh, you know, I'll just say a few words, and we actually have a number of wonderful questions here. You know, in the last 10 or 15 years, I've seen that the aspirations of the faculty have really grown. And I think they're evidenced by the comments that you heard. You know, they're not con content exclusively with publishing, but they're interested in seeing how their work has impact. And that is more than a shift from basic to applied. I think Dan referred to this as the lower right-hand corner of the Pasteur's quadrant. It's youth-inspired. But what I'd like to say is this shift in these, to these bigger aspirations has had some really amazing and interesting consequences. Uh, researchers, students, think big in a variety of areas. Roadmaps for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, engineering biological systems, epistemology in an area of multimedia systems, multimedia sources of information, global public health, strong privacy for strong security. You know, listening to President Bollinger talk about First Amendment, you know, one of the things that has come is really a union between lawyers and technologists, which has made the case that technologies for strong security, strong privacy actually enhance security. Uh, and another example is academically as well. We've had new fields of inquiry that have been created. For example, in the Blum Center for Developing Economies, developmental economists working shoulder to shoulder with engineers, business, science, and sociology, and public health faculty have formulated a new field of inquiry called development engineering, which is a way of axiomatizing what works and why by a process of continuous assessment of pilot interventions. In our cybersecurity centers, we have created a science of cybersecurity much inspired by the paradigms of public health. Indeed, the terms used in public health, viruses, worms, epidemiology, are very much the metaphors for such a science. This new science of security is a very rich interweaving of law, policy, economics, and information technology. We believe that this is important to educate the new generation of innovators by giving them big canvases and big problems to paint on. We expose them to the complexity and multidisciplinarity of big problems faced by society. We give them a broad palette of tools, approaches, 
maybe even the next big things to be able to work on this. And I believe that this amalgam, and Paul referred to this sort of as our Berkeley way, really contributes to our mission of educating leaders and creating knowledge while serving society. So uh, with that sort of just slight response, and I think I'm sort of really rephrasing a lot of what you said, let me dive into some uh, questions. Uh, you know, the questions could equally apply to everybody, so why don't we just say whoever jumps in is be good. How can researchers respond? The first question, how can researchers respond to immediate real world problems without losing sight of a basic vision-driven research that may yet to have a clear, defined outcome. Maybe we'll start with you, Peter. I think uh, a lot of what you said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did he say in response? <laughs> oh, I, do, I do think, I mean, uh, Peter, I think when you spoke about the role of social science research and its uh, connections, you know, the core disciplinarity, for instance, you know, in sociology, you talk about teams and, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for that core discipline. That has a huge impact on how people build widgets in the world. And so, uh, so that's an example. Yeah. I, don't, I don't need to <laughs> pick on you specifically. I mean, <laughs> it's a... Um. Oh, you know, I, I wish I had a coherent answer to that question. Um, I mean, I think that we, that, that it, it's sort of posing a false dichotomy. That the, it's as if the real world problems are somehow, you know, somewhat trivial and easily solvable, and we can kind of just go off and do those, and then, you know, in our spare time or, you know, in our other moments, you know, do the deep work that will handle the, the bigger problems. So I guess the, the proper way to think about it is that the real world problems are absolutely fundamental and basic, and they, that's what we have to demand, you know, that's, what we, that's where our attention goes to. So, yeah, we need to understand how do we produce, um, you know, what's the relationship between collaboration and creativity? We might, we might code that as a basic research problem, but it, it's gonna be a fundamental problem for, for all sorts of um, real world inequalities that we see in the world. So, if I could reject the, the, the terms of the question, I'd be super happy. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let, let me ask a different question. <laughs> sort of retreat from that here. Yeah. Growth is offered as a panacea, even in our finite world, was the question. Is the endless frontier of research a realistic approach uh, to move from endless, or is it, uh, is, is it a more, is a more realistic approach to move from endless growth to a sustainable model more appropriate to finite resources? Should we get a Steve Paul? Okay. You. <laughs> you can reject the question too. No, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't reject that question because I think it's a good question, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's provocative. Um, look, I mean, I, I, I think that first of all, I mean, there seemed to be a question there about endless growth of inquiry as opposed to endless growth of economy. So let me just say that from everything that I can tell, uh, we're only just beginning to learn things. So there's no lack of important deep discoveries still to be made that will change humanity in ways that we cannot even begin to predict. And that's something that we should all be trying to do every day. So, um, but when it comes to the issue of uh, kind of global sustainability and what happens when we have um, perhaps as many as 10 billion people that uh, on the planet that uh, all would like to have uh, their children to be doing better than them and to have access to um, energy and, and the ability to be healthy, uh, there are uh, amazing uh, difficult questions that arise in the course of trying to think that through. Um, and I think that we are, um, as a community of scholars, uh, we're well posed, uh, well poised to be able to engage in a big debate around that question. It's not a simple one. Personally, my own view is that we can achieve um, a very sustainable uh, future uh, with that population, but it will require us um, to really uh, start to think about how we use resources um, in, a, in a qualitatively better way than we have. And we will start to emulate nature more to create cycles 
of how things are used instead of uh, only uh, using something and then discarding it. And, and, and if that becomes a kind of fundamental paradigm for how we think about things in our technologies, then we can achieve sustainability and it's one of the grand challenges for, um, for all of our societies to do that. Can I, can I sit here? Yeah, please, Karen. Uh, it seems like what you're t uh, that we should be talking about transformation of consciousness. I mean, that what you're saying is that that situation, science can't solve that situation unless the need and desires have changed of what people think they need or what, how people actually live their daily lives. No? I mean, how, how, it's not possible. Perhaps. Well, I don't know that that, well, possible. I mean, uh, it's very difficult to judge what's possible uh, in a context where things are changing so rapidly in terms of what we can do technologically. We're certainly feeding a population on the planet that is so much larger than what you would have thought was possible uh, 100 years ago, and yet it's happening perfectly fine. So we have to be careful about that particular one. But I think there, it is very clear that we've reached a point where we can't simply consume a resource and assume that after that consumption it just is um, thrown away. That we can't do anymore. And that's a change in how we think that has not yet permeated the way in which we act uh, in, in, you know, both as people and also in more collective forms. So I'll, I'll just, this is a very, uh, it's a slightly provocative question, but I'll make it even more provocative. So uh, the question is, have we in research universities made research too much the province of graduate students and postdocs? And have we, uh, what can we do to more thoroughly involve undergraduates in our, uh, in our research endeavor? That's the, that's the question. I'll jump in and say, I mean, I think the story that Carol told about the business school is, on, you know, it's the sad story of most arts and sciences experiences and social science as well. I was thinking, listening to Michael, that, that you know, I was interested in social science because it, we could revolutionize the world. And then you go to graduate school and, and what happens is this progressive disciplinary process of, of stripping away all of the normative values that you have until you end up doing something you know, that's you know, of, of value within the discipline. So the question I think that's interesting is how can we capture the imagination, excitement, um, commitment, and, you know, and maybe that you know, somewhat distasteful normativity of, of young people and put it to work in exciting ways. And, and we're not doing a very good job of that. What we do is, is a great job of creating, of disciplining them into doing something else. And, um, it, it's a little bit, um, you know, one of, our, one of our dilemmas is that we try to, f we try to stimulate innovation at, at exactly the wrong moments in the academic life course. Like we, we try to stimulate innovation for postdocs, which is exactly when they need to be building careers. Or we try to stimulate innovation for young faculty right on the cusp of tenure. So we give them their leaves right at the point when they need to be most disciplinary. And so there are these other moments of undergraduates, of the last couple years of a PhD, of just post-tenure, where people are free to think new thoughts. And we could organize our, our in interventions to capture those moments more effectively. Maybe in an art school, you're, you're, you're better at, uh, you know, I really uh, accept Peter's hypothesis that we sort of, people come out of high school really full of beans and full of great ideas and innovation, and we beat them into submission instead with 3D prerequisite charts. <laughs> so, you know, that's, I didn't think you said that, Peter. It's a less polite way to know what you say. But maybe in art schools, you, you, you are, you know, you do foster creativity right from day one. And are there lessons in it for all of us? I was trying to talk to that a little bit, but there is some of what you're describing, even in art making, which is that it always used to be the great dismay of um, when I was at the Art Institute of Chicago that the undergraduate show would look better than the graduate show. Like, this was really distressing. And part of that was there was this rawness, raw energy of not knowing what you shouldn't be doing. Um, that happened with undergrads. And by the time people go to graduate school, as creative as they are, and they go on to do such amazing things in the world, but still, there's this professionalization where they become too conscious of the field 
and wanting to succeed in the field, even among artists, that they're afraid to do certain kinds of things that might make them look bad. So I think, although I think we probably do better, I think we, we have some of that too. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Well, you know, in the sciences, I, I feel like there's a, you know, we're really falling very far short with our undergraduates. And part of it is because the way we've developed things, typically, we ask them only questions that have exact answers. And we don't challenge them with problems that are open-ended, where their creativity has to come into play. And so I think that there's um, enormous opportunity for us to try to think through as a community how we can better take in the sciences these very fresh and capable minds and not just impose on them the ability to be excellent human calculators, but to be more uh, engaged as minds. Yeah. I also wanted on the record that I, I did not say that about business schools. That that, that that was, I just want, I wanted public on the record, that that was, sa it was yeah, said by business there. school oh. deans to me. <laughs> I just. All right, uh, I, I'm told this is the last question, so let me direct it to you, Sujay. Uh, it said, university incubators and news centers, such as Berkeley Skydeck and the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation, are great for prompting commercially viable innovations. But how can universities continue to provide innovations that aren't marketable? How? How? Okay. I deliberately directed it to wow. you. Wow. Uh, so how can we support days. innovations that are not marketable? Do you, do you mean that won't make money, but but with but that can't be monetized? Okay. Um, well, we're fortunate at Berkeley to have a lot of strong supporters from foundations who care more about less about making money than actually helping the world. So I think we're very fortunate. We have students who actually work on, um, as I think EVCP uh, Breslauer mentioned, um, they care about global poverty, uh, alleviating that. They're not looking to make money for themselves. They want to go out and, and make a difference. And we do have the um, uh, Center for Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship and Technology, this Berkeley Sky Deck, to support students. And we give them seed funding. And they go off and do great things. And the solutions they come up with um, are sustainable in that they're not necessarily going to make money, but they actually can make en enough money to recover the cost. So, it's, so I, think, I think our students, are, are, especially our undergrads, are very creative, figuring out how to do a lot with very little. And that's, I think, another thing that makes Berkeley special. OK, well, I think uh, I'd like to so, so thank the panel. I didn't, we couldn't get into all the questions that uh, we had here, but I'd like to thank them. Thank you, Shankar. I, agree, I appreciate your <clears throat> doing a great job in the moderating. And, and I, I want to mention, um, Hannah um, Gray mentioned the, the, the legendary school of hard knocks. And I, it made me re remember um, something that my grandfather said. He was uh, from an immigrant family, and he had never actually finished high school. But he said to me once at the end of his life, he said, um, I went to the school of hard knocks so that it could get all of you into, the, into Fort Knox. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> and, and, and I think he meant that in the very sense that we're talking about here in this room, that Fort Knox is, is, uh, is the kind of place that we, the, that we think about it here at Berkeley. I mean, this, we think of Berkeley as a Fort Knox of ideas. Now, Monday morning, I opened up the newspaper, as many of us did, <clears throat> and, it, and it saw a headline describing the result of a complex calculation based on data from the Kepler Sky Survey that estimated there were 40 billion Earth-like planets in our galaxy. I took a great pleasure in that, as I think most of us would. Um, but there was a second pleasure when I read that this work was done by Eric Patigula and his advisor, Jeff Marcy, who are both here at Cal. Um, and this idea that we are not alone, that we share this universe, is quintessentially Berkeley. You might say, as Paul said, this is, this is really, I think, the Berkeley style. We talk about cross-disciplinary, sometimes um, transdisciplinary, uh, polydisciplinary, I like paradisciplinary. Um, we might, some have said that Berkeley is a multi-universe, it's a multiversity, but really at our core, <clears throat> we are a university with values that we share in common. And we take seriously our duty to study and understand deeply and with rigor the diversity of this universe that we live in. We believe we have a duty to change the world. 
And especially as this world becomes more global, as we've discussed, we believe deeply in the power of the people. As Bertrand Russell said, every great idea starts as blasphemy. And here at Cal, we have no shortage of blasphemies. <laughs> <laughs> and we love to challenge the sacred cows of conventional wisdom. And they have led to a long series of, of great ideas and discoveries, new atomic particles, new vitamins, viruses, formulas, models, meteors, cosmic forces, and planets. So I want to thank all of the panelists here this morning, <clears throat> the dedicated staff here at Cal, in particular Beverly Ingram, who I've had the pleasure to work with on this panel, and <clears throat> um, the you, the audience, for your attention and great questions and great spirit throughout, and especially you, <clears throat> Chancellor Dirks, for proposing this symposium and giving us the challenge to step back and think about what it is that we do and who we are, and to bring together such an eloquent and insightful group of speakers. And as we, we close, I want to return to this idea of the free speech movement and the idea of the freedom of inquiry, academic freedom, which really I, I strongly believe is the central defining characteristic of all universities. That duty, that freedom to step, to ask hard questions and to challenge conventional wisdom is at the core of what we do and who we are. It is about, it requires us to be rebellious and disobedient, to question authority, as Michael Roth said, to resist conformity and tyranny. And it, it challenges us to celebrate diversity and counterintuitive ideas, to champion dissent, to enhance experimentation, enthusiasm, and empathy. These qualities incur a number of demands on us as faculty, we have demands of faculty governance, governance, but also make us, as a group, a challenge to lead. The Berkeley faculty, staff, and students are an exuberant group of stray cats. <laughs> we are rebels, and we believe deeply in our causes. So welcome to Berkeley, Chancellor Dirks. Welcome to Berkeley. <laughs>